Well, good morning and welcome back to our series, Not Today, Satan, where we are kicking the devil in the teeth. And this is not to diminish the power that he has, but rather to recognize the greater power and the greater authority that lives within us. The Bible says that that all of heaven and, and earth have been given to Jesus, that he has won the victory. He's already defeated death, hell, and the grave. And so the enemy, he has nothing on us. It says, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. He cannot snatch us out of the Father's hand. But the truth is that we can give him authority over us. We can give him power over us that he doesn't actually have. And so this series is looking at his most powerful tactics in sidelining us and keeping us from from being who we have been called to be in the kingdom of God. And then and looking at the word of God, just like Jesus said, when he stood against Satan, he said, said, no, Satan, for it is written. And he quoted the scriptures and he stood on the word. And that's what we are called to do as well. So in the first uh, kind of segment of this series, we looked at fear and we looked at the story of Gideon um, and how God took Gideon on this journey of overcoming fear. And, and then in the, in the last segment, we looked at the story of Jonah and how Jonah was a man that was filled with pride and how God took him on this journey, ultimately still accomplishing his purposes through Jonah, but taking him on this journey of understanding what was really inside of him and how the enemy was working against him in that way. And today we're looking at a fence. And I'm here to tell you today, the same as fear, the same as pride, offense is not a feeling, it's a principality. A principality is a state, a region that is ruled by an authority. And the Bible says we do not wage war against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And and. If I'm doing anything in this series, I want to open up your mind to see that the things that you struggle with, the attacks from the enemy, they're not just little insignificant things. They may seem small. They may just seem like a feeling. But what the enemy is trying to do is entrap you under the authority of one of his principalities. There are principalities of fear, principalities of pride, principalities of lust, principalities of entitlement, principalities of, of offense is what we're looking at today. And so when, when we take up offense, what we're really doing is we're subjecting ourselves to the authority of the the enemy in different contexts. So that's what we're looking at today. And, and I want to share with you as we get started today, I, I've had a lot of personal opportunities to work through offense in my life in different ways, as I know some of you had as well. And um, there's been really three waves of potential um, massive offense that have, have have come to me in my life. And I want to share one of them with you. There was a friend that I had uh, before we get into the story for today. A friend that I had over the course of six years became a very, very dear friend in my young adult life. And um, we were very close. Um, I respected this, this friend a lot, this man a lot. I uh, developed this relationship. And one day, um, some pressure came to the relationship. And this person ended up um, separating himself from me um, and from our friendship in a very difficult and um, offensive, potentially offensive way, and actually robbed me of $45,000 and cut off all contact um, with me. And so the options at that point are to like sue somebody, I guess, or, you know, believe for potential restoration in the future. And so um, very, very difficult opportunity for me. And the reason I tell you that is to just share with you I know the attack of offense, the bait of offense, and what it can do in our lives to rob us of the purpose that God has for us and to rob us of the the future that God has for us and to try to get us stuck in this self-imposed prison under this principality. I'll share with you the amazing God story of the conclusion of that, um, that those events and that relationship um, here at the end today. But I want to jump into the story for today. Offense is a lie from the enemy that is intended to keep you from reaching your potential in Christ. Offense is a lie from the enemy that is intended to keep you from reaching your full potential in Christ. Mature believers are 
difficult to offend. Very difficult to offend. And we look ultimately at, at Jesus himself. Uh, Judas, who, who was, I mean, perpetrating the ultimate betrayal against Christ, what was Jesus' response to that? It wasn't offense. It was to kneel down and to wash his feet in an act of, of servitude and of humility. One last attempt to get Judas to change his mind on the plan that he had set forth to, to betray Jesus. This is who Jesus is. Impossible to offend. <laughs> and we're called to be like him. And so we need to be incredibly difficult to offend. God wants you to identify today where you have believed the lies of the enemy and given authority in your life to the spirit of offense. Maybe things that you're aware of right now, maybe things that you're not even aware of that are just rooted down deep that you maybe have never dealt with so that he can dismantle those lies and release you to realize more of your potential in Christ. Now to do this, we're gonna open his word. We're gonna take a fresh look at the story of Naaman from 2 Kings chapter five and the practical steps that God took to release him from the spirit of offense and free him in his kingdom potential. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to open your word. God, we are grateful for your word. We hang on your every word, Lord. It is like life to us. You are the bread of life. You are the living water. And we thank you for the power of your word, for the blood of Jesus Christ that lets us connect with your word and the influence of your Holy Spirit that, that brings it to life off of the pages and gives us life through through those principles, through the truth that you have set forth for us. I pray that today, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, free us today, God, from any spirit of offense that the enemy is using to hinder us from becoming all that we can be in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so uh, open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. Quite an incredible story, the story of Naaman. And again, through this series, we're looking at the same four principles that God uses to release us from the traps of the enemy, from the attacks of the enemy. The principles are the same through every element of this series. So these points are the same, but they're applied differently um, to different situations and based on different scriptures. So I hope these are setting in for you. This is now the third. Uh, the third sequence in this in this series. And so I hope you begin to actually internalize these points and recognize them in your own life so you can follow this prescription that God has given for healing and freedom from the attacks of the enemy. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, a commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. So Aram is this kingdom alongside of Israel, and the king of Aram has this great, the Bible says, great admiration, a great respect for Naaman. And um, it's really interesting because today, if you have a king or a queen, or maybe like a, a president or some famous leader, and they say that they have great admiration and great respect for a person. Well, that person is that person is succeeding. That person is winning in life because they have the respect of this great leader. And so that's a person that people will look up to and say, "Wow, like I want to be like I want to be like them." So that's Naaman's kind of situation. He's a man of great honor, great respect. He's a mighty warrior, but he has this struggle. And he has leprosy. So leprosy in the day is an incurable disease where you would get these sores on your body and eventually you could have even like limbs actually detaching from your body, just devastating and ultimately resulting in death. Um, and so people were outcast because of that in the time. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. She's talking about the prophet Elisha in the land of Israel. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl had said from Israel and um, said, go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. What a great guy. He's given his letter of, of recommendation. <laughs> 
So Naaman started out carrying as gift 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, With this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, This man sends me a leper to heal. Am I God that I can give life and take it away? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me. He will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. Need often paves the way for us to accept our God-given identity. A lot of these stories um, start out with an incredible need. In the story of Gideon with fear, there is this grave need in Israel because they're being oppressed by their enemies, the Amalekites, and they have no food. They're being destroyed. They're being taken as slaves. Um, Horrible circumstances. And the Bible says, and so then Israel cried out to God for help. In the story of Jonah, we see similar example where the people's physical need of being oppressed by the Assyrians and the Ninevites, the capital of Assyria at the time, finally matches up. Their physical need finally matches up with their spiritual need, which has been there the whole time. Their need for a savior, their need to be freed from the, from the curse and the penalty of sin. But that one we don't realize as quickly. And so once our physical need matches up with our spiritual need, then often we cry out to the Lord for help. And things are no different for Naaman in his situation. He's a mighty warrior. Things are going great in the land of Aram. And uh, finally, his physical need of, of being a leper matches up with his spiritual need and now he's desperate and he's he's crying out to the gods at the time for help. And this servant girl gives him the understanding that there's a God in Israel. So Naaman realizes his physical need and that drives him to begin to accept his God-given identity. Now in this particular story, he doesn't really know the Lord yet, um, but that, that desire, that hunger, that need is stirring within him and he's realizing that he isn't all that he really thought he maybe was cracked up to be. And so it leads us to verse nine where he begins to embrace the refinement of God. And in verse nine it says, so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message, go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River, then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. Now this is where Naaman's refinement starts because he's traveled all this way from his land over to the land of Israel to see this prophet. He's brought all of this wealth with him as a gift, and he has a letter of recommendation preceding him from the king of this nation. So he's got everything going for him here. He shows up at the prophet's house after this journey with all this wealth, with his letter of recommendation, and the prophet doesn't even come out of the house but rather just sends a messenger to the door and gives him these instructions to go and to dip himself into the River Jordan. And so Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. Now catch these two words and don't miss them. I expected... I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy, call on the name of the Lord his God, and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the the Abana and the Farpar, far better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. The spirit of offense just brews and stirs within Naaman, trying to keep him from the healing that God has already ordained for him. He's already come all this way. He's already brought all these resources. He already has the blessing of his king. He's already come to the prophet. The prophet's given the message of what it will take to experience healing. He's he's told him, you're gonna be healed if you dip in the River Jordan. You will be healed. He has the word from the man of God that he came to get. But because it didn't come 
come in the way that he expected, he's about to miss out on the life-changing power, healing power of God. He expected for God to move, but he boxed God in on how it should take place. And I'm here to tell you today, expectation channels offense. Expectation channels offense. You see, complacency sets in when you don't expect God to move at all. You become complacent in your spiritual walk. You become complacent in your life and your world gets really small and and your life becomes very stagnant. Your spiritual walk becomes very stagnant and you get picked off by the enemy when that happens. You should expect for God to move. You should come here, here in the word of God, expecting for God to stir in your heart, expecting to leave different than how you came in. You're watching online. You should be expecting for God to speak through his word, to change your heart. And that when you, when you turn off that video, when you come away from your computer, your phone, you're a different person because of the word of God, the power of the anointing, the spirit of God on his word. You should expect God to move, but offense sets in when you expect him to do it the way that you want him to do it. Complacency when you don't expect him to move. Offense when you box him in with how you expect him to move. So Naaman did this and he's about to miss out on supernatural healing because of it. Now God takes him even a step further and praise God for the people that he had surrounding him. Verse 13, but his officers tried to reason with him and say, sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says so simply, Go wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the river Jordan and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. There was a stripping away of Naaman's pride and of his expectations, which led him into the the prison of offense, the spirit of offense. And God had to strip him down of that, quite literally, to where he's coming now down to the river and imagine this scene. He's just gone to the, to the prophet's house. I mean, he's come into Israel with this massive caravan of officers and camels and donkeys and wealth and like all this stuff. And it's this man, this great famous warrior coming with the blessing of the king. And, and here he is with his whole entourage and, and he's covered up probably because of his leprosy and everything. He's got strips of cloth, you know, he's all covered up. And here he comes into Israel and people, oh wow, what is this? this? This caravan, this mighty warrior. And they're following along, seeing what's going on, what's gonna happen. He goes to the prophet's house, he gets the word and he turns around to leave and his officers are, they're talking with him, they reason with him. And so he goes down to the Jordan River. So now here he is on the banks of the Jordan River. His whole entourage is is laid out. All of his officers, all of his servants, everyone that's with him. And you've got the people of Israel as well that have lined the riverbanks and are looking what's gonna happen. And so in this moment, all eyes are on Naaman. He gets off. He starts walking down to the river and he begins to strip off his clothing to dip into the river. Now, as he's doing this, the reality of his situation is revealed to everyone around. You know, just how disgusting leprosy is, the sores and the wounds, and it's just a nasty, nasty disease. And Rather than being able to cover it up, he has to strip that off to go down into the Jordan River. And this moment is so symbolic of what it takes for us. We have to be willing to strip off the things that are binding us, to, to take off the old, the old grave clothes, you know, as we're going and, and expecting God to do something, believe in him to do something. And, and that's really the truth of this power to overcome. Step three, we have to believe God for the power to overcome. And as Naaman was stepping into these waters with everyone gawking at him, and he's taking off these clothes, revealing the the reality of his situation, this is the moment where he's really believing God for the power to overcome. And he's doing what the prophet said to do. I think all along he had been holding out for hope and 
perhaps we all do this to an extent because of the desperation of our situation. When we get really desperate um, for a relationship to be restored, we'll, we'll hang on to anything, any hope. Um, for a sickness to be healed, we'll hang on to any kind of hope, a medical treatment or maybe some famous pastor or preacher or evangelist that we, we've heard stories that there's been healings taking place. You know, our family knows people like this and it's like, well, okay, we're going to go and we're going to have someone pray, pray over us, you know, and they've, they've healed people before and, well, you know, let's see what happens. We're hanging on to any kind of hope. And it's easy to put those things over our faith and our trust in the Lord because we love a process. We love a plan and we want to follow that plan. And that's what Naaman's officers told him. Like, if it had been some complicated plan, you would have do it. Like, if, if, if it was, hey, fly to Africa, and there's this, this great healer, and he's going to, this bishop, you know, he's going he's gonna to heal you. And, and, and like, we'll, we'll spend the money, and we'll go to the plan, and get on this bus, and drive 15 hours into, the, into nowhere. Like, whatever it might be. Like, we'll follow a plan, no problem. Like, I like plans. And do this crazy regiment for your health. Like, eat only carrots for 40 days, you know, like we'll follow a plan. But trusting in the Lord rather than in a plan, and I'm not saying don't do any of these things is beside the point. My point is trusting in the Lord and that restoration ultimately comes from Him. Healing ultimately comes from Him and, and not leaning on plans or journey or anything like that is really the that's the that's the move of faith that's the the journey of faith the growth the development of faith happens in trusting god not substituting a man-made prescription uh, for faith and trusting god so the real power to overcome is realized when expectations are stripped away and there are no other options left but to step out in faith on the word of god that's when we really begin to believe for God's power to overcome. And at that moment, we get to watch God do the impossible. So Naaman went on this journey through a fence, and he almost stepped away from his purpose and his healing because of that. But then he allowed God to strip everything away. He embraced the refinement. He believed for God's power to overcome he put it all on the line. He let his pride go. He let his offense go. And now he sees God do the impossible. In the latter half of verse 14, uh, Naaman went down to the Jordan River, dipped himself seven times, just as the man of God instructed him. And imagine he, one time, nothing. He dips again, nothing. People are looking like, ah, nothing's happening. He dips again, three, four, Five, oh, who feel like an eternity. Six, still nothing. Come on, on the seventh try, I'm believing for God, for his word, for what the prophet said. He dips, he comes back up. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was completely healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him and Naaman said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except the God in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. Elisha replies, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts. And though Naaman urged him to take the gift, Elisha refused. Then Naaman said, all right, but please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place and I will take it back to my home with me. From now on, I will never again offer any burnt offering or sacrifices to any God except the Lord. Naaman found freedom from his own expectations and so he found freedom from offense. He found freedom from his leprosy and so he found freedom from his idolatry his worship of false gods, and ultimately he found freedom from death by believing and having faith in the Lord is credited to us as righteousness, as the righteousness of Christ. So number one, to review, accept your God-given identity. There's no room for the spirit of fence when you know who you are in Christ. It doesn't matter. Nobody can do anything to you to, to offend you because you are rooted 
in the word of God. You're rooted in who you are, in Jesus, and nothing can move you, nothing can sway you because you're planted in that place. To be offended is to be off-ended, to, knocked, to be knocked off of, of your axis, you know, to knock off of the place that you stand. And we're standing on the rock, nothing can move us from that place. There's no room for offense when we have our identity rooted in Jesus. Number two, to embrace the refinement. The Lord will root out the spirit of offense if you embrace the refinement. Impure gold can embrace the fire because it knows that on the other side is purity. And if gold is already pure, then it has nothing to fear from the fire because it has nothing to lose. So let go of your expectations. Expect God to move, but let go of your expectations of, of what healing is going to look like for you, of what this relationship is, is going to become, of what this career, how it's going to unfold. Let go of your expectations of God, you need to do it this way, my way, and trying to box God in so much that you don't even realize, you don't even see what he's trying to do and end up completely missing out on what it is that he wants to do through you that's so much bigger, so much greater. The Bible says more than we can ask or or even imagine. So embrace the refinement as he's trying to strip away the things that are holding you back, the old grave clothes that you're still wearing, even though he's set you free to life. He wants to strip off of those things, strip those things off of you and set you free in your calling and in your purpose. And number three, believe for power to overcome. Trust God to give you what you need on this journey. And finally, watch God do the impossible. Watch him free you from the spirit of offense. To just wrap up the story that I was um, sharing with you in the beginning with a friend that had taken so much financially from me and kind of severed our friendship. I knew right at the time that um, the answer was kindness, that the answer was restoration. And I would say it was like a hard journey, but it it really wasn't, and it could seem like $45,000 being taken is a lot of money, six years of friendship and investment, it's such a betrayal, it's so debilitating, but the truth is the Lord gave me such vision and such perspective that it never even felt like a hard thing to let go because my eyes were not on the offense, the infraction that was made against me. My eyes were on Jesus and the fact that I have been forgiven of everything. I deserve to be, to be destroyed forever. My, the wages of my sin is death. And I have been set free and given eternal life and been given the mind of Christ and been given a crown uh, and a robe of righteousness that I can't wait to just cast down at Jesus' feet one day because it's not mine. And, and in that moment, I knew that through the Holy Spirit, like this isn't mine, this offense is not mine to take up and Jesus is in the business of restoration and who knows what led to this situation for my friend to cause him to, to act in this way and to do something that just seems so just so abnormal and out of character for him. What pressures caused this situation? What's going on in his life? I don't know. And I knew that if I, if I became offended because I expected a certain thing from, from him that he then didn't fulfill, then I would cripple the opportunity that God wanted to give me to be a mechanism of restoration. If I pick up a fence, the sword of a fence, and I start wielding that sword, how can I then be the balm of Gilead, like Jesus was called? How can I then be a facilitator of restoration? How can I then be a peacemaker? How can I do all of those things if I'm waging war to protect myself, my identity? And the truth is God has given me back in my life that money many times over has re replaced the friendship many times over. Like he's given me tenfold what, what I ever lost that day. And, and I knew that he wanted to bring restoration to that relationship if I could just not grab onto a fence. And, and because of his spirit, it, be, it became an easy thing for me. And over the course of the next few months and even the next few years, that person ended up needing a lot from me and like would randomly reach out even through other people um, to see if I could help with certain, certain things. And 
um, a few times I would be like, oh, I don't, like, I didn't feel like I wanted to help. Like, I'm okay with not being offended, but I don't want to go the extra mile and, like, do something and, and step out and help. But the Lord um, continued to just take me through the refinement process, just like I'm telling you, embrace the refinement. That's I'm telling you these four points because they, they're living and breathing and active in my life, and it's a process that I have derived from the Word of God and that I now try to follow in every situation. So part of embracing the refinement for me was to serve and to help over and above and beyond what would have ever been expected. And it's interesting, five years later, five years, and it doesn't always happen quickly, but five years later, there was an opportunity to where that friend and I ran into each other um, randomly, and we were not expecting to, and we hadn't talked. I had tried to reach out. I had tried to do you know, can reconnect and meet up and catch up and just let bygones be bygones and and move forward, not in the same way that we were before, that it will never be quite like that, but in a different way, in a new way, in a way with healing and, and more maturity and more uh, a deeper depth to the relationship than ever before. So we saw each other and um, his wife had actually passed away and he had a new wife there that day um, over the course of five years. And he got caught trying to introduce me to her, and he said, hey, this is, um, this is Chris, and um, yeah, like, he got all tongue-tied on, like, where the relationship was at, <laughs> and it was an intense moment, and um, I released him in that moment. I felt in my heart, this is the moment that you've been waiting for, to just really release him and, and, and offer freedom and total forgiveness from the past. So I put my arm around him and I said, your husband has been one of the greatest blessings in my life and in the years that we were close friends and and serving the Lord together um, were some of the greatest years of my life where I just learned so much and was so blessed by his friendship. Um, And you, you you married a good one. And she just started crying and she's like, oh, I know, you know, that kind of thing. And um, he just looks at me and because she's hugging him and he looks over her shoulder at me and I'll never forget, he just looks in my eyes and he's weeping and he just nodded and mouthed the words, thank you. And we're not best friends, you know, again, the way that we were, but that's what God can do. He can take a situation where it seems impossible, like you've got to be enemies now because of what happened. And he can free you from the prison of offense that the enemy wants to put you into. And he can give you life and he can give you life abundantly. And he can, rede- there's no situation that the Lord cannot redeem. And I'm here to tell you today from the word of God and from my personal experience that if you accept your God-given identity, if you embrace the refinement, if you believe for God's power to overcome, you will see God do the impossible. May he bless you today and always.